Well, for those of you that haven't been here, David and I have actively been going through the Signs of Mind textbook. If you're not familiar with it, it's the Writings of Ernest Holmes. And it's that big one that's on the keyboard there. And we've been taking a chapter each week from it. But the last, last week and this week, we are staying in this one because it is called Teachings from the New Testament. And it's part five of the textbook. And last week, this week, and for the next probably two weeks, we are going to do the part of it that is from the teachings of Jesus because there just is so much there. Um, so last week, I had us look at the idea of how cause and effect operates through judgment. And this week, I would like to continue with that idea of cause and effect because when we're talking about cause and effect, we're talking about the law, the aspect of God that is the law. And in Science of Mind, if you don't like the word God, just translate it to whatever word works for you. Um, I went through that stage, but I'm good with God now. Or <laughs> universal energy or whatever word we choose, they're all fine because there is only one. So indeed, the truth is that there is no word that you can say that is not of the oneness of all life. There are some that are constructive and some destructive, however. And so we want to be always telling ourselves the most constructive ideas that we can possibly imagine. Forgiveness, I said, is a huge topic. And I don't pretend that I can share all that there is to share about it in one talk. Um, but what I know is that the longer we look at the idea of forgiveness, the deeper we are able to practice it in our lives and the happier our lives become. Letting go. So I'm reminding us of a statement from our founder, Ernest Holmes, that I shared with you last week, and I'm probably going to share it for a couple of weeks here because I think it is foundational. It is that the law of cause and effect is the law of perfect balance, of logical sequence, and of inevitable consequence. Perfect balance, logical sequence, and inevitable consequence. So when we're talking about law, we are talking about God. Law, capital L. So I have a question for you. Have you ever caught yourself thinking, geez, why is my life the way it is? I'm a really good person. So why is A and B my life experience? Now realizing that A and B are not the totality of our life experience maybe allows us to open up to those areas within our own thoughts where A and B exist and we are playing them out in life. I must admit that I have, have had that experience in my life probably a lot more times than I can count, especially when I was younger. But after years of practice, I instantly know the answer. As soon as that question comes to my mind, why is this the way my life is? Why is A in my life? Why am I experiencing that? And my answer is that the first part is true. I am a good person. And I dare say that we are good people. Probably all of us would consider ourselves, at least I hope you would, and if you wouldn't, get a counselor, a spiritual counselor. <laughs> Sarah, Sandy, David. See a spiritual counselor because you deserve and you are made in the image and likeness of love. There's nothing else you can be. So you are loving. Do we always play that out in our lives? Probably not. And sometimes we play out loving for the, what's that little saying, you, you, I, I, what I did, I did for the right reason, just did the wrong thing, something like that, yes? You can probably all relate to that too. So here is my answer for that second part, A or B, or whatever we 
perceive as the destructive negative parts of our lives are occurring because we have been ignorant of the law. That is not a put down. That is a responsibility for which we can take charge of and change our stinking thinking and attract a different A and B into our lives. The good news is that we have the power to change it. And how do we do that? We do it by aligning our thought with love and law. And that is a terminology that we use for God, for the one being, the one power and presence, love and law. Aligning our own thought, our own knowingness to become one with the Creator. Ernest Holmes wrote in this text, in the long run, nothing judges us but the immutable law of cause and effect. We do not say there is no evil experience. What we say is evil is not an entity, but a misuse of a power, which of itself is good. So Mark read today for me, about destructive versus constructive use of law. And in this, Ernest Holmes wrote, and I will repeat, law will ultimately bring back to us the result of the forces which we set in motion through it. The spirit of Christ, that Christedness, meaning that spark of divinity within us, is the spirit which constructively uses the law. That part of you, let me say that again, that part of you that knows and knows it knows that it is whole, complete, and perfect. That is, it is love in action in the world. Moses taught that the first principle or law of cause and effect running through all of life is the I am another word for all these words that I keep giving us. The I am refers both to the individual, to you and to me, as well as the universal, the I am. Jesus said that Moses, that, that he came to fill the law, fulfill the law that Moses shared, that Moses spoke about. And he did this, Jesus did this, by teaching people to understand their personal relationship with God, the I am. Teaching people to understand that I am within them so that that is what we practice in life. And we <coughs> remove any and all ideas of ignorance to any laws that are presently taking effect in our life, the A's, the B's. This understanding allows each of us to stand in the light, knowing we are the light, because we are one with the light of life. It follows that with this understanding, we come to live in the world in a manner which reveals the highest God and the innermost God is one. And we, share, we read that today when David shared the principles with us. And by the way, I'm going to do all the talking today, and he's going to do it all next week. And it's not because we're going to do that regularly. We did it a couple weeks ago. And it's because these messages from Jesus, there are so many of them. And we want to give you as much as we can and as full an idea about them as we can. And we didn't want to do two ideas in the same Sunday like we did last Sunday. <laughs> So <clears throat> realizing that there are many, many lessons that we can learn from Jesus and from many other people also. So in um, Matthew, it's stated, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Ooh, that can be pretty heavy, can't it? Especially if you grew up like I did with a Christian fundamental belief. It means that 
you know you've done something wrong. And so you're never quite good enough. And that is not what Jesus meant. Jesus would never have taught ye are sinners. In fact, he says the opposite. But what it does mean is that there's a law of cause and effect in the universe. And according to the action and the thoughts, the ideas, the belief systems that we have based on all our history, that's how life's showing up. And we have the power to change that again. One of those ways is to forgive. So let's take a look deeply at what forgiveness is and what it is not. The University of Berkeley says that psychologists define generally forgiveness as this, a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. Wow. A whole new meaning for forgiveness, yes, and one that very much aligns with science of heart. <coughs> In his book, Dare to Forgive, Dr. Ned Hollowell, who also writes in Oprah, says that you must first understand what forgiveness is not in order to begin understanding what it is. He says it is not turning your cheek, running away, or condoning what has been done, nor is it about you defending yourself. So he created a four-step process, and I sort of liked it. The first one is dealing with hurt and pain, or what has been done. And dealing with that involves communicating it, sharing it with others, someone that you trust. Venting with someone helps us to feel validated, and it also helps us to feel connected. His second stage is about relating to the rational or logical side of this practice. So as you can see, the first idea relates to the feelings, admitting your feelings, admitting what's going on. And the second part is looking at the logic. And he suggests um, asking yourself the question, what do I want this pain to turn into? He says your answer to that question is the hook that will free yourself from the poison of hatred. For indeed, hatred, uh, not forgiving, plays out in our bodies. It shows up in many ways in physical form as anger and hatred within us. And so that third one is, what do I want the pain to turn, the second one, what do I want the pain to turn into? And then the third one is working it out working it out of your body, working it out of your mind. He says that's about ridding yourself of anger, and that's what forgiveness means. He suggests using prayer and meditation. Have anybody here ever heard of that one? Prayer and meditation, sitting in the silence, sitting on the beach and just listening to the waves roll in, thinking about the awesome abundance of life. A powerful way to reveal healing within ourselves. He also suggests creating a mental inventory of all that you have to be grateful for and think of your future. In Science of Mind, we very often say, whatever you think about, you bring about. And so think about what it is you desire. See it in your mind's eye. Actually see it so strongly that your body feels it. You feel as if it's already true. So true that you believe it, and that becomes the belief system that plays out in your life so that you live it. The fourth idea of the process he suggests is renounce your anger and resentment. And what he means by that is realizing that when you feel someone has wronged you or harm has been done to you, feelings, those feelings maybe come back up again, and you have to forgive them again. You have to release them again. You have to go back to the feeling part, the logical part, the prayer and meditation and thanksgiving part. And finally, he says, T 
teach others the skill of forgiveness. I had never heard that step before, but it really resonates with me since I'm a teacher of fifth graders, and I very often hear, oh, well, those who can do and those who can't teach. And I just smile and say, okay, you're entitled to your opinion, but I definitely don't agree with that opinion. Those who can share. So as we learn a new trick, and old dogs can learn new tricks, as we learn something new, like forgiveness, it is for us to teach it. And how do we teach it? We model it. We share it. We be that person that sits with someone else when they're in process step number one, feeling it, sharing it. And we hold that confidentiality for that person. At Erasmus University in the Netherlands, researchers had the study group, had their study group, write down a time that they either gave forgiveness or withheld forgiveness. And then they had each person in the study group jump without bending their knees, and they recorded the measurements. The people who wrote down that they forgave had almost 12 inches in height jumping with their knees locked. And those who had held a grudge averaged approximately eight and a half inches in height. That's a remarkable statistic showing us how much freer we may feel having let any and all burdens fall away. And there are many stories of how forgiveness shows up and impacts life. In fact, you probably have some. I know I have some. But I was searching and reading them, and I found one that really touched my heart. And it's the story from, you may have even heard of it, in 2006, there was a 20-year-old firefighter or an EMT by the name of Matt, and he was just getting off duty from his shift, 24-hour shift. When he was driving home, he fell asleep and his car drifted across the line and hit another car, killing a woman by the name of June who was seven months pregnant. It killed her and her 19-year-old, 19-month-old daughter survived the accident. Her name was Faith. June's husband, Eric, was obviously devastated at the loss of his wife and his unborn son, along with having to deal with taking care of his daughter. And Eric often, over the course of the next months and years, imagined what he would say to Matt if he could see him. However, his attorney had told him that he was not to have any contact with him until everything was settled at least. But two years after, while the courts were still doing their thing, Matt had decided to send Eric a, a card because he too, for those two years, had been experiencing such pain and devastation at what he had done. And so he went to the store, and as he was returning to his car, he saw Eric coming out, walking toward him. And he started crying. And Eric walked over to him and hugged him. And they ended up talking for two hours in that parking lot. Eric extended compassion and kindness, forgiving him. And at Matt's sentencing, Eric asked the judge for leniency, and Matt got a fine and community service. The two men have been meeting and having meals for over a decade. Their families are, friend, are friendly. They have each married, in Eric's case, remarried, and their families spend time together. These are some of their words. They say they are reminded that there's grace and there's hope and there's good. Each of them says that their bond is the strongest friendship that they have ever experienced. By the way, Eric is a pastor, and he teaches and preaches forgiveness. He says forgiveness is a choice 
not a feeling. I think that's important. We often get mixed up because we have feelings around it, and we think it is a feeling. It's not. It's a choice. He says, in moments of great tragedy and hurt, you have a choice to make between grace and vengeance. I chose grace. Matt remembers Eric telling him to not allow that moment to define him. And an interviewer of the two men said that she thinks their story sounds like a miracle. And they told her that they do consider their relationship a sign from God because their strong bond feels unexplainable to them. And by the way, Eric, when he remarried, had another baby, and that baby was born on the same day in October as the accident. Wow, wow, wow. Forgiveness is so powerful, so powerful. And when Peter asked Jesus how many times he must forgive, Jesus says, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And Ernest Holmes tells us that there is no limit to the amount of times that we forgive. That 70 times seven is another way of saying forgiveness is eternal and always available. Ernest Holmes says in this chapter, the eternal mind holds not against anyone. The mind which condemns understands not the truth of being. And the heart which would shut the door of its bosom to one who is mistaken strangles its own life. To him who loves much, much is forgiven. Law of cause and effect. How active it is in our acts of forgiveness or not. In John 10, Jesus says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. That was Jesus' message. Jesus was, was never telling us that we are lowly, that we are sinners, that we are bad. Jesus is saying, I have come, that you might have abundant life. And so I'm going to end us today with something, a cute, I think it's a cute little seven-step process that answers the question, how do we live life abundantly? I think they're cute ideas because they're a little unique compared to usual steps to do. The first one is, don't wait for your day off. I really love that. Don't wait for your day off. The second one, appreciate a good breath. Can't you see yourself and feel yourself sitting there at the beginning of the day, eating your breakfast peacefully, healthily, and loving life? Number three, follow the rhythms of the seasons. Number four, discover the small things that make you happy and seek them out every day. Number five, educate your palate. I really like those words, too, because that doesn't say get on a diet, make sure you eat right. Educate your palate. It empowers you to take charge. Know what makes you come alive. I think some of us need to just start right there. What makes you come alive? What makes you feel good? What makes you live in joyous expectation? And finally, a seventh one, form good habits. Form good habits. And those six, the first ones sound like pretty good habits. And so as you have already probably been doing, looking at where there might be a place for you to forgive something in your life, and it may be yourself, letting go of what I talked about last week, the judgments that we make about ourselves, and letting go of any and all negativity and destructive ideas so that the cause that we have is in the positive and the effect that we have is joyous life. And so it is.